What's up everybody, Thralls Metal here once again. I'm the Croc Neck and I have yet another album review for you. And this one I guess is a sequel or a continuation. Namely, I am reviewing this because I reviewed the last one and this is part two of the last one. And I, I guess I should just cover this one just because, I mean, let's just get both parts here. So we're going to go over the latest offering from Chelsea Grin, Suffer in Heaven. This comes out on the 17th of March on 1 RPM. This band formed in 2007 in Salt Lake City, Utah. This is their seventh album overall. And again, this is kind of a continuation because their last one, Suffer in Hell, was released last year and it was intended to be a two-part album. This is that said second part, Suffer in Heaven. Either way, I think I am uh, suffering for continuity here. So for those that don't know, this is a flat out modern deathcore act. They've been around for a while. They deliver, you know, big heavy grooves, lots of syncopated riffs, chuggy breakdowns, more breakdowns on top of that. In true sequel fashion, I would say this is Chelsea Grin part two, The Breakdown Strikes Back. This is, I, very similar to the last one, honestly, and uh, like so much so that I, I feel like a lot of these tracks are interchangeable. So a lot of my gripes that I had about the last one, and believe me, I had plenty, are kind of present on this one, namely because I think all these songs were probably recorded at the same time, and whether or not the themes are different, like in terms of, you know, like Suffer Now probably having something more to do with Hell, and then this one uh, more about heaven, I guess. I imagine there are some different lyrical themes or something thematically that makes these two separate entities, but at the same time, musically, I feel like these were definitely written at the same time, and uh, they kind of went to the same well for both. The opening track opens up with ambiance, some, you know, uh, just sort of background noise, and this kind of dissonant melody that builds up, and it honestly sounds like I started off Meshuggah's bleed at the quiet bridge before it explodes again. Until some garbled spoken word comes in, and then we are off to Breakdown City, and that is a good chunk of this album. This album lives and dies by the breakdown, and by all of the different atmospheric special effects they can throw on at any given moment. This album is, once again, the definition of overproduced. Honestly, I was kind of uh, brought back to when I went over Distance last album and that being a giant overproduced album. Honestly, if you took tracks on that album and mixed them up with this one, I don't think you could tell the difference. Like, they kind of both have that same wheelhouse. Lumbering grooves, big syncopated breakdowns, bottom heavy guitars, and again, lots of uh, special effects and samples and keyboard effects. There's even a dubstep-ish little transition in this opening track, and believe me, it's not the only one. There's some other ones that I just feel like they let the laptop take over and uh, just kind of chugged along with it. Now, before I just, you know, get completely negative about this, which I've already kind of started off in that direction, there are some things I do like about this album in terms of stuff they do with atmosphere and with guitars. There's some really solid lead work on here. The last track, The Path to Suffering, has a really awesome lead on it, and the melody behind it, I think, is particularly catchy, too. There's even some flourishes of what almost sounds like, you know, Indian music, too. Like, not necessarily like a sitar or anything, but the melodies feel... I don't know, uh, very much like Indian music. Yorm the Giant actually has some really interesting atmospheric touches with like almost video game noises before it goes into the inevitable breakdown, but the breakdowns are a little bit more fun on there. They're a little bit bouncier and they make good use of the sense in terms of like shifting around the atmosphere. Like it starts off very aggressive, but kind of, you know, playful again with like, you know, contra music kind of playing behind the breakdowns. And then it kind of shifts into more like evil, sinister territory. And honestly, the synths on there sound pretty damn good. And the big standout for me is The Mind of God, which, I mean, kind of sounds like a more death course version of the Black Dahlia Murder, which I know they had Trevor on their last one. Rest in peace once again, Trevor. But this one, it kind of captures the vibe of Black Dahlia Murder. You have some slightly more you know, melodic death metal riffs. You kind of go back and forth between those and breakdowns. The breakdowns are actually kind of cool. Like there's a good stomping rhythm in there that reminds me a lot of like early Fear Factory. And there's a really cool tapping guitar melody, which is drowned out by a lot of extra noise and samples and layering. And yep, we're gonna circle back to the bitching here. Overproduction is such a huge thing on here. 
I know that they probably wanted this to sound huge, much like they wanted it to sound huge on the last one, and for continuity's sake, it kind of has to. But honestly, it works against them. Because when the riffs are really good, and there are some really clever moments in terms of the songwriting, I feel like they are overshadowed by all the special effects. Like, again, this is like a Michael Bay movie where, you know, it's all about the explosions and the showmanship versus any sort of, like, semblance of, like, creativity or, you know, uh, some cleverness. And even when this album does get, like, a little bit more clever in terms of, like, mixing up the riffs a little bit and adding a little bit of melody or just something outside of a fucking syncopated chug, it kind of gets buried in, again, like, additional effects. Like, you have just constant vocals going in terms of, like, vocal layers. I don't know if there were guest stars on this one. I didn't really look it up because I know there were a bunch on the last one. But regardless of that, you have tons of vocal tracks. You have highs, you have lows, you have hardcore shouts, you have spoken word. This album never shuts the fuck up. And again, if it's not the constant barrage of syncopated riffs and, you know, again, vocal layering, there's a lot of samples on here, like samples from movies. I want to say the song Fathomless Maw actually has... It's either JFK or RFK. I can't remember the speech exactly. I'm going to guess RFK because JFK just seems a little too obvious. But they have a speech that he gave essentially about terrorism, I believe, going over a breakdown. And admittedly, it kind of works a little bit, but after the sample drops out, you kind of just realize like, oh yeah, this is just kind of another breakdown, which that is most of the album. And when it comes down to breakdowns, I would say <laughs> this band has like three gears. You have your standard deathcore breakdown, you know, like just hard pummeling, you know, hardcore energy, death metal sinisterness. We know the type. We've been hearing it for years. You have the ultra slowed down one, which pops up a lot and in fact closes a good amount of songs. In fact, the first three songs, Leave With Us, Orc March, and Fathomless Mall, all end in very similar fashion. Uh, there is a brief atmospheric pause. And then we just get into the big, slow, stupid breakdown with, you know, weird synths and atmosphere behind it. And uh, they kind of feel interchangeable. Like, there's really nothing about the breakdowns that stand out other than they are heavy. And there's nothing wrong with just being brutal and heavy, but there's no real identity to it. And that's kind of an issue with this album, honestly. While thematically it might be different than the last one, musically it is almost the same album. And I, again, I kind of wonder, like, if the intention was to write two separate albums that would have their own vibe versus they just wrote like over 50 minutes worth of music and they decided to break it up into two albums. Because there's part of me that thinks that these albums weren't supposed to have any separate identity whatsoever. They just wrote a lot of songs and didn't want to trim out any, even though a lot of these songs kind of sound very similar. And if they did, did they kind of front load this? Because honestly, I think Suffer and Hell might have flowed like a little bit better. There's some dynamics on it that I actually liked more than this one. This one felt like you had a couple of, you know, standout tracks, namely The Mind of God, I would say Yorm the Giant, and uh, The Path to Suffering especially. But the rest of it just kind of feels like filler. Like Soul Slave is barely over two minutes. It just has a syncopated, bouncy breakdown, and they really do kind of nothing with the riff. Like it is just sort of a their song, it's a little bit more, you know, uh, up-tempo. Like, it kind of has, like, an almost new metal bounce to it. Like, maybe kind of something similar to Slaughter to Prevail. Like, it's a little bit more energetic, but it goes nowhere. Orc March seemed like it had some potential. Like, it kind of leads in with, like, a, you know, kind of a War March snare. Like, you hear samples in the background that sound like it could be battle-themed. And it comes in with all the breakdown bluster it can, but the atmosphere kind of shifts. And there's this really particularly weird breakdown on there where... Before each snare hit, it sounds like someone's shuffling a deck of cards in front of a microphone. And I, I don't know what the idea was there in terms of like making that sort of a atmospheric touch to sort of like, you know, make the orc thing kind of work, but it doesn't. It just sounds like something extra. And that's sort of an issue with the atmosphere in terms of all the synths and, you know, samples and shit. Like sometimes it feels like it is intended to be part of the atmosphere and it does weave into the song a little bit better. And then other times, it's just a fucking noise. Either way, half the time, I feel like it's there to sort of kind of cover up maybe the fact that the songs are kind of dull. Like, they kind of just do the same thing overall. There's a couple of standouts that 
kind of get outside the box, but not that far, and they do return. Maybe they'll get a little bit different with the third kind of breakdown, which I totally forgot to mention, which is Meshuggah. Meshuggah breakdowns. Namely, I would say the opening to Sing to the Grave. I swear they probably got that on loan from Meshuggah. Like, that was sort of a B-side riff that they were toying with on nothing, and it's like, yeah, you can have this. And they took it, and... I mean, it sounds a little bit different, like it has a notably more genty feel to it, but they just end up going back to the same syncopated chugs that they do that, well, again, they just kind of get boring. So yeah, while I really wasn't looking forward to going over this because I really wasn't a huge fan of the last one, but I figured I'd at least cover this one since I covered the last one and this was intended to be two parts. And well, much like sequels, I don't think part two is as good as part one but honestly, I wasn't a big fan of part one. So yeah, this one overall gets two stars. Honestly, it feels like B-sides. It really kind of feels like extra stuff that they kind of threw on to make another album. And I mean, that's kind of almost the vibe of all of this together. It feels like a collection of songs rather than an album. Between both of these albums, I only think there's like a handful of songs that really stand out and and you kind of get outside of the box. Like, yeah, of course, this is deathcore. You need your chuggy, groovy bangers. You need all the breakdowns possible. But when they do that and employ some different stuff as well, like, you know, some cool leads, some different melodies, it actually sounds pretty decent. Like, not something I would listen to all the time because, you know, namely, like, the overproduction really kind of annoys me because this barely sounds like a real band. This sounds... Again, kind of artificial. Why this is a two-part album is, I don't know, a kind of a mystery. This is a part two album that has no identity really separate from the first one, at least musically. Again, the themes might be different, but musically, the songs are interchangeable. There's really nothing on here that you can't get on the first album. At least speaking from like my listening experience, when you have like a double album or a two-part album, you know, you want a reason to listen to both. This one, there really isn't much of a reason. In fact, you can mix up all these tracks again and kind of get the same effect. There isn't that whole side A, side B sort of thing there where, you know, each side kind of has like a different vibe to it. I don't know, the whole thing kind of feels like just an excuse to put out literally every track that they worked on during these sessions. But that's just me. If you dug the first one, you're probably really going to dig this. If you like, you know, more modern deathcore again, Brand of Sacrifice and like Distant and stuff like that, definitely check this out. Like it's got a ton of heaviness, lots of syncopated chugs, kind of everything you expect from modern deathcore. It's not really my thing. I kind of felt like I was obliged to review this one. And it isn't as though like some deathcore doesn't appeal to me. Like I still really enjoy that new Suicide Silence, which still kind of shocks me. But uh, this is just definitely not my thing, but don't just trust me. Check it out for yourself. So if you enjoyed this review, give it a thumbs up. If you are new to the channel, subscribe because we do stuff like this all the time. We are also on Patreon. If you'd like to help us out there, there's a link down below to thrallsmetal.com. Our store is there. We will eventually reload on all of our stuff there and possibly get some new stuff. But we're going to wait until we are back from Denver Death Fest, which is taking place literally next month. we got a ton of bands. We still have tickets available. Three day passes are 60 bucks, two days, 45, one day is 25. Pick one up, there is a link down below. We'd love to see you there. We'll be there for all three days of it, hanging out and just BSing and probably drinking some beers and talking about how much we like death metal. It's a very distinct possibility. But yeah, if you're interested, definitely come out and come see us. And of course, thank you all so much for liking, subscribing, following, all that shit. It does mean the world to us. I know I say the same shit at the end of every video, but I mean it. It's really awesome doing this. Again, one of the coolest things I think I've ever done in my life. And you guys make it so much fucking fun. We love BS with you guys, the comments, the live chats. It's been a ton of fun. It still remains a ton of fun. And hopefully it will continue to be a ton of fun. So once again, thank you all. And we will catch you later.